My interview with Andrew Basevich will answer a central question. Do our security policies actually keep us safe? Welcome to the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. The most basic assumptions that Americans make about our national security policy is that it will make us all safer. But is that really true? Do interventions around the world really ensure that our country is more secure? Joining us now from Boston is Dr. Andrew Basevich. His books include Breach of Trust, How Americans Failed with Their Soldiers and Their Country, Washington Rules, America's Path to Permanent War, and The Limits of Power, The End of American Exceptionalism. Welcome to the program, Andrew Basevich. Thank you very much. Well, first, uh, do you think that the U.S.'s over-reliance on military power has actually made us less safe? For example, with the U.S.-led war against ISIS, has our militarism fueled their cause? If you look beyond the ISIS crisis, uh, and consider the purposes of U.S. military intervention in the greater Middle East, uh, we're trying to do three things. We're trying to bring about stability. We're supposedly trying to e export democracy. And certainly, we're trying to win friends and influence people. Uh, we've been at this for a long, long time. We've achieved none of those three objectives. So it seems to me that uh, it's pretty obvious that our military efforts are actually counterproductive. So it, even if they're counterproductive, that doesn't necessarily mean that they might be making things worse. Is our military power actually pe making people so angry that overall it makes us less safer here in the U.S.? Well, I, I think there's no question. Uh, and I think here Iraq would be the uh, perfect example. Intervention in the name of stability actually creates greater instability. Whatever we may think of Iraq under the regime of Saddam Hussein, it was in fact a relatively stable country. We fractured it through our invasion of 2003, and the country has never recovered. And in fact, uh, it's as a result of that fracturing that space is open for militant organizations like ISIS. Now, what is the uh, main reason that we are told that our military fighting abroad makes us more safe at home? But what's behind that concept? Where did it come from? During the decades of the Cold War, uh, the United States created this vast apparatus that we could call the national security state, uh, and Americans fell into the habit of believing that uh, having U.S. forces spread around the world, maintaining military capabilities to support global interventionism, we fell into the habit of thinking that those notions worked, that they, that they produced stability, that they, they helped to promote democracy. Now, in terms specifically of the Middle East, um, we know that there is a lot of anti-Americanism, and often we hear in the media these questions of why do they hate us. How has historically U.S. policy contributed to directly that anti-Americanism? I think uh, especially since 9-11, uh, with President George W. Bush's declaration of a global war on terrorism. Uh, that triggered a very considerable expansion of the U.S. military presence in the region. And, and what U.S. policymakers failed to appreciate adequately is that, frankly, we're not wanted. I mean, we are viewed as infidels. We are viewed as uh, outsiders, as a, as a hostile force. And so the increased American presence triggered by 9-11 has actually increased the amount of anti-Americanism in that part of the world. Now, uh, I'm wondering if you feel that Americans today are more apathetic about our wars than we as a country were during, say, the World Wars or even the Vietnam War, and if that, too, sort of contributes to our own insecurity. Uh, when the United States uh, abandoned conscription uh, toward the end of the Vietnam War, it, the United States was, in effect, abandoning the tradition of the citizen soldier. That is to say, the notion that citizenship somehow entailed some obligation to contribute to the defense of the country. Well, one of the unanticipated consequences of abandoning the tradition of the citizen soldier and embracing 
what the founders would have called a standing army, has been to create a gap between the military and the American people. Now, the gap is disguised by all of this rhetoric of support the troops and flags flying at, uh, you know, before baseball games and the like. But the reality is there is a gap, and one of the consequences of that gap is that the American people really are not invested in the wars undertaken by the state. And so, yes, they are apathetic, they are inattentive, and despite all this, the support the troops rhetoric, the fact of the matter is that we really don't care about our soldiers. That is to say, we don't care enough to insist that they should only be committed to wars that actually must be fought. And so in many ways, we have this large history, right, to draw from about the failures of U.S. militarism, and yet this idea of American exceptionalism continues to persist. We hear it in the speeches of our presidents. How pervasive is this idea today? Do most Americans buy it? American exceptionalism is hardwired uh, into uh, our sense of who we are as a people, quite inappropriately, uh, but, but it is. Uh, this, this notion that, that we are different, uh, this notion that we are chosen, that we are called upon uh, to play a specific role in, in history uh, is, is something that seems to resonate. And I think that's why American politicians are constantly trotting out these, these claims, because they believe, and I suspect based on some evidence, that that plays well with the people whose votes they are seeking. And does it infect directly military policy as well? Sure it does. Uh, I mean, it, it, it does in the sense that uh, the ultimate explanation uh, for uh, U.S. military actions in whatever part of the world uh, is that we are fulfilling our mission to spread freedom. Americans like to hear that, uh, even when it's not true. Americans are somewhat reluctant, too reluctant in my view, uh, to sort of probe beneath the surface and examine the actual motives for U.S. action. Now, you write in your book that the U.S. knows how to start wars, but we don't know how to end them. And what do you make of the way in which we've ended our wars and, and how that has, uh, in, in so many cases, uh, derailed the very processes that we were supposedly trying to address? Well, I think the big lesson is wars are difficult to stop. The military persuaded itself that uh, if it sallied out onto the battlefield and basically clobbered the other, other side uh, and forced them to give up in a military sense, that that would solve the issue. When you think about the U.S. entry into Iraq in 2003, we raced up to Baghdad, we clobbered the Iraqi army, we overthrew the Saddam Hussein regime, we grabbed Saddam uh, himself, and the, the U.S. military's expectation was that that ought to have fixed the problem. Well, the, the facts showed otherwise. The facts showed that uh, overthrowing Saddam Hussein basically opened up a huge can of worms, an insurgency that they had not anticipated and were not prepared for. What's the, what's the real lesson here? The real lesson here, I think, is that the difficulty of ending a war neatly is yet one more reason why you really ought to be very cautious about starting a war in the first place. Professor Basevich, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Glenn Greenwald brought us the Snowden revelations about the national security state. But secrecy is a bigger problem than one whistleblower and one agency. On the next episode of the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum, we'll talk with him about how secrecy threatens democracy itself. People become much more conformist and cautious and afraid. Um, they make much more limited choices whenever they perceive that they might be monitored as opposed to when they believe they can act without being watched. And so a surveillance society is really a conformist society, which is why almost every government craves surveillance.